We acknowledge the traditional owners of the land on which this podcast is recorded. We pay our respects to their elders, past and present, and to Aboriginal elders emerging. Hello, friends, and welcome to our 100th episode of Australian True Crime. They said you'd never make it, but you finally came through. For all of you who've made it, this one's made for you. Remember that? Yeah, sorry if you don't. Uh, apologies to our international listeners and any Australians under 30. That's from an old beer commercial from the 1980s. But we are celebrating because our first two Melbourne live shows with Ron Idles and Narelle Fraser sold out very quickly. So quickly, in fact, that we've announced an extra show with Narelle. So check out our Facebook page and join our mailing list to make sure you know what's going on. Also, This Sunday night, that's Sunday, May 12, Mother's Day in Australia, I'll be doing a YouTube live session for everybody who's interested at 6pm Melbourne time. So you'll be able to chat back with me uh, about this week's episode or the podcast in general from 6pm Melbourne time this Sunday. Check out our Facebook page again for more details on how you can get involved in that. Of course, our wonderful patrons had first dibs on tickets in Melbourne and they made very good use of it. So if you'd like to be first in line next time, you can sign up at patreon.com forward slash ost true crime pod, patreon.com forward slash ost true crime pod. Okay, on with the show. Please be advised this podcast contains descriptions of graphic violence and is not appropriate for children. Snowtown is a tiny town in South Australia. It's about halfway between Adelaide and Port Augusta. But of course, ever since the town's darkest day in 1999, it's been so much more and yet so much less. Than that. This is Australian True Crime with Michelle Laurie and Emily Webb. Come with us as we go beyond the news cycle to find out how people become killers, how people become victims and what happens next. Journalist Jeremy Pudney wrote one of my all-time favourite true crime books in 2005 about the bodies in the Barrels case, also known as Snowtown. It is, of course, the story of psychopathic serial killer John Bunting and his accomplices, his friend Robert Wagner, his stepson Jamie Vlasakis, his informer turned victim Barry Lane and the man we'll call their associate, for reasons that will become apparent, Mark Hayden. More than that, though, Pudney's book helped me understand it was also about a vast underclass of human beings eking out an existence in the northern suburbs of Adelaide. It was this book that taught me the importance of background and context when looking to understand crime. It's the tragic commonalities in the lives of the victims and the perpetrators in this story and just how common their stories were in that time and place That's what we're referring to when we say we want to find out how people become victims. How was it that more than one of these victims was never even reported missing? How is it that one of the perpetrators was allowed to live as a child in a sexual relationship with a grown man and convicted sex offender without authorities ever being notified? How was it that to several of the victims and perpetrators alike, John Bunting was the first person who ever made them feel protected? Sometimes people become victims because the rest of us allow them to live in conditions that keep them vulnerable, and then we blame them for not somehow overcoming them. We begin this conversation with journalist and author Jeremy Pudney by talking about the fact that he now has youngish children, but those children and copies of the book live under one roof. I'm afraid to say I'm a bit more suspicious as a parent than he is. I don't want to sound egotistical. There's a small number in the bookshelf at home. And so my 11-year-old has spotted them and asked me about it. And I've gone so far as to say to him, look, it was a bunch of really bad people who did some bad things. And I wrote a book about it because I used to be a crime reporter, which he knows. And you can read it when you're 18. If that was my kid, particularly my, I was going to say my son, Louis, but I reckon both. Mm -hmm. The next time I wasn't home, they'd have that down and they'd be looking at the photos. There's no no photographs in there that are particularly sort of gut-churning, but even just reading 
my kids would get that book down and have a read. Do you reckon they have? You've alarmed me now. <laughs> <laughs> because it hadn't occurred to me and the answer is probably yes, so I'm going to remove them. <laughs> yeah, I would. My daughter, who's nearly 13, who was always embarrassed by my crime interest in writing, is now starting to, I think, take things off the bookshelf. Yeah, yeah but how old were you when you started reading? Like 12. Yeah, right. I was, yeah, yeah. right into yeah. it. Yeah. What about you, Jeremy? Were you a true crime reader as no, a young person? I wasn't much of a reader at all, <laughs> which made a bit of a mockery of, of wanting to be a journalist. In fact, my year 12 English teacher told me that I didn't write well enough to be a journalist. So that was, oh. a, that was a body blow early in year 12. Yeah. But I scraped through and got what I wanted in the end. So no, I became more of a true crime reader when I became a crime reporter. Obviously didn't get enough of it during the day. And from about that point on, I was kind of looking for the opportunity to do a true crime book, probably waiting for the right case to come along. And I was on the day the Snowtown story broke. Well, the second day really because it was secret for the first day. But I went there, you know, when the wave of media arrived. And so I was there for, oh, I think it was a couple of weeks. I often look for books written by journalists when it comes to these big cases in Australia. Right now, there are a couple of cases where I'm sort of waiting and hoping that a journo, a crime writer, will be working away on something because I want that kind of eye. And I think that's because this book of yours is just one of my favourite true crime books. It's so detailed, but it also informed me about the context of the community that all of these people, the perpetrators and the victims, came from. Otherwise, it's just like a case of, it seems like a case of crazy people. Yeah, look, I think it was the context was important because in some of these cases, it would be easy to blame the victims in some way for what happened to them. And the reality is that that's unfair, obviously. And you kind of have to understand where these people have come from and the kind of family lives they've endured and the upbringings they've had and to apply a rational, normal mindset to their situation would be wrong because one of the reasons that these killers were able to go on for as long as they did in an undetected way or a semi-undetected way towards the end was because victims weren't reported missing or they weren't reported missing for a long time. And that was because they came from fractured, unusual backgrounds. And so that was no fault of their own. But what it meant was that what happened to them went undetected and then what happened to others went undetected as a result. Yeah, but it also explained to me how the perpetrators came to be a group because that that always fascinates me, how these groups of people find each other. Sometimes it's it's even, it's couples, you know. How do these people find each other? We often ask ourselves, your book helped me to understand how in some of these cases, well, in all of these cases, how John Bunting, at least initially, was a person that they were so happy to have in their lives, how he represented a father figure to a number of them, how he represented for the first time in their lives somebody they could rely on, somebody who wasn't taking advantage of them sexually, somebody who was fighting for them. Can you explain that to us, please? Can you explain that context to us? Yeah, sure. I mean, the interesting thing about John Bunting is that his background wasn't that different in terms of trauma and troubles to some of the other people that he then coerced into his circle of killers, if you like. But he had this way of endearing himself to people, of making them think that he would help them, save them, protect them and earn their trust. And then what he did, I think it would be fair to say, is got them to a point of no return where they were implicit in what had gone on, either by helping after the fact early on or by taking part in murders or luring people to their deaths. And so once he had you, he had you. And he was also a terrifying person. I mean, clearly he's a terrifying person. Yeah. Um, but he he demonstrated on an almost daily basis to people that he was a terrifying person. And so these were people who don't have the usual skill set, the wherewithal to walk away or report it to the police or whatever. Instead, they were roped in by him and kept in by him. And he had this pull over people. You or I would cross the street and roll our eyes and think, geez, he's a bit weird. But he would endear himself to people who were at their lowest ebb, who'd suffered trauma or abuse typically. And he would come across as some kind of saviour, draw them in and then get them into a situation where it was too late for them to get out. And childhood sexual abuse was endemic in this community, right? This could never have happened if that weren't the case. No. So this is, it's clearly, you know, unfortunate that Snowtown is how these 
killings have become known because that's where the bodies were found and that's where the last murder took place. But the reality is a lot of this happened in other places well before that. And the, the epicentre of this really is the northern suburbs of Adelaide, so a suburb called Salisbury North and the surrounding areas. And that's where Bunting came to be. That's where he came to know Robert Wagner. That's where he came to know Mark Hayden. And that's where he came to be in a relationship with the mother of James Lasarkas. And all of these people were drawn into his killing circle with him. And Bunting almost certainly endured sexual abuse as a child. It was never formally investigated, but he told people that that was the case. Um, and it seems likely that that was the case. Robert Wagner absolutely was sexually abused as a boy and then abused continually by Barry Lane, who became one of the victims and was also involved in you know, helping after the fact with one of the murders. And then Mark Hayden, there's no evidence that he was sexually abused as a child, but I suspect he had a tough upbringing and that was probably demonstrated in the way he treated his stepchildren. And James Lasarkas endured the most horrific abuse of all. And so he was very susceptible to John Bunting and shared his thoughts of revenge to some extent. And that's what I mean about the context. You just, you made me feel sympathetic for the perpetrators. Yeah, and that wasn't deliberate. I didn't set out thinking that way. And I think everything they did, they had an excuse for. Mm. So it wasn't so much a justification or a reason. I think it was an excuse. And the reality is John Bunting modelled himself as some sort of anti-pedophile crusader. The truth is he had a burning hatred for homosexual people. And he really couldn't differentiate between the two, which was very wrong because it just wasn't true about many of his victims. And even those of his victims who were pedophiles, you know, they had endured their own trauma that had led them down that path, if you like, and they didn't deserve what they got. But certainly for James Vlasakis, I felt like I can understand. I'm, I'm not excusing anyone's actions, but I could understand how someone who'd been so badly abused could fall for an older man who came into his world and said, I'm going to punish pedophiles. Will you help me? And that's what happened. Mm. And that's what happened early on. But I think it wasn't too long after that, that James Vlasakis, at least what he says, is that it wasn't too long after that, that it became more about fear than having a saviour or justice. He well, because felt they murdered James' brother, right? And James' brother had been abusing James. Well, they murdered his half-brother, Troy Yude, half that's right, yeah. who had been abusing him. But they murdered his friend. They murdered his stepbrother. They murdered people that James Vlasakis liked. It got to the point where he was actively involved in the luring of these people to their deaths. And it became as much about bloodlust for John Bunting and Robert Wagner as it did about any other kind of motive and theft and stealing their money. So it would be wrong to paint these guys, Bunting and Wagner in particular, as crusaders against pedophiles or, or child abusers. It was one of a suite of justifications they used to do what they wanted to do. I think also the other part of this story or the big thread going through it is I think it showed many Australians a kind of depravity and just the hopelessness almost painted of life in this these suburbs of Adelaide and obviously they get a bad rap. I mean, I mainly heard of Elizabeth as an area that was once big in manufacturing, then the jobs went and there's a lot of social dysfunction and I think that as well really shocked me with this case these people went missing and they weren't even reported. It's a tough area. It's yeah. always been a tough area. But it exists oh. in every city, doesn't it? Yeah. It does. And it's not dissimilar to the same sorts of areas in other cities. And, you know, there was probably two things that helped me when I was writing this book. And the first thing was that I was a, a crime reporter, a police reporter who went and covered this right from the start. And the other thing is that I'm from Elizabeth. So I'm from that area. So that probably helped me know a bit about it how it works, how it ticks. It was at the time a working class area, a lot of public housing, housing trust, as it was known there and then. But there were a lot of good people living good lives, mm. working hard mm. in that area while this was going on around them. So were you shocked? I was shocked. I mean, obviously shocked by the crimes, but were you shocked by the lifestyle that was exposed to many of us by the crimes? I was, yeah. Okay. I, was, I was shocked by the lives that some of the victims in particular had been leading where they'd been living, how they'd been living, the fact that they could disappear and no one would notice for such a long time. Can you talk to us about the victims? Can you talk about some of those lives? Yeah, sure. I mean, well, the first victim is probably the one that typifies, you know, some of these issues more than anything else, Clinton Tresize, because yeah, he was yeah. a young man. Uh, he was a loner. He had become uh, disassociated from his family to a large extent. 
and he had been lured by Barry Lane, who was a pedophile and who becomes a victim later. And Clinton Tresize was an overtly uh, homosexual young man, but he was a kind young man and he was a quiet young man. And John Bunting just took a hatred to him, just hated him. And there was no suggestion ever that Clinton was a pedophile no. or, or had ever assaulted a child or anything. Ticked any of those boxes that Bunting claimed were what he was out to get? Well, I think he was a quiet, introverted, troubled in himself young guy okay. who never created any trouble outside of himself. And he was picked on for what he was by a man who killed him, you know, bashed his head in with a shovel. There's just so much tragedy in the Clinton Drusice part of the story mm. in that firstly the way he was murdered, yeah. the reason he was murdered, where his body was dumped in a paddock north of Adelaide to just lay there for years, the fact that he wasn't reported missing for several years after he vanished. No one knew what had happened to him and he didn't have that kind of close relationship with anyone who would just persistently say, this isn't right, someone should look for him, someone should find him. He didn't have that. And even when they found his remains and even when he became an active missing person, there was a mistake there, a forensic mistake that didn't put two and two together early on and that, you could say, enabled things to continue on. Ray Davies was a 26-year-old. Yeah, so Ray Davies was a very troubled young man. He was a pedophile. Uh, he had become a nuisance in the neighbourhood. He would commit indecent acts in the street. He drew attention to himself. He was known to police and he was trouble in the area. He had been in a relationship with another of the victims, if you like. It's a bit more complicated with Suzanne Allen. And in more recent times before he vanished, had been living in a caravan in her yard and she had become friends with John Bunting and Robert Wagner and given the way Ray Davies behaved, it didn't take long for him to appear on their radar. As the rate of murders picks up, which is typical with serial killers, the justifications become more varied in well, like Bunting's own mind. What's the justification for Suzanne Allen? So they've murdered Ray Davies, the pedophile who was living in her garden. I expect supposedly to rescue her children from him. Is that right? No, her no? children weren't really on the scene oh, then. Okay. So this was just, they had befriended her for whatever reason. Ray Davies had appeared on their radar. He was an obvious target for them. You know, they liked to kill. And so they killed him. Now, Suzanne Allen was infatuated with John Bunting and she was a pest for John Bunting. Yes. And she almost certainly had some knowledge of the fact that they were involved in the disappearance of Ray Davies. And so the Crown case was that she knew too much. Now, they were never convicted of the murder of Suzanne Allen. It's the one victim where there was no conviction. Their claim before the jury was that they found her dead and they just cut her up and disposed of her. It was an unusual wow. decision by a jury that had found yeah. Bunting guilty of 11 other murders. But, you know, from my point of view, and I think I say in the book, they killed her and uh, it was because she knew too much. So twisted, isn't it? It's just the vulnerability of everyone and it just keeps going. It's another thread, if you like. A lot of these victims had, you know, either intellectual disabilities or borderline intellectual disabilities. Suzanne Allen was one of them. Clinton Tresice was likely one of them. I mean, the whole friendship with Wagner is so bizarre because Wagner is a pedophile. Wagner is a cross-dressing, flamboyant homosexual who makes no bones about any of that or his predilection for underage boys. How did Bunting explain away their friendship and how did any of that fit in his manifesto that he was presenting to the others? Well, it was Robert Wagner that he really became friends with. So Robert Wagner had been abused as a boy. It's what really turned him from a typical child into a troubled child and then had ended up in the northern suburbs of Adelaide with his mum and had met Barry Lane. Barry Lane had found him. And Barry Lane drew Robert Wagner in and whisked him away from his mother. And in fact, they disappeared together for several years and only surfaced again in the same area when Robert Wagner was 18. And that was almost certainly a deliberate ploy by Barry Lane so he could keep the boy with him and, and not attract attention. And so when Lane and Wagner used to hang out in the northern suburbs, it was then they bumped into John Bunting just by chance one day in that area. And it was really Wagner that Bunting befriended. And he hated Barry Lane right from the start, but he had decided in his own warped way that Barry Lane would be of use to him because he could feed him information on others like him, if you like, in the area. And so while he was saving Robert Wagner 
from his situation. He was also getting information from Barry Lane to the extent that he would keep a dossier, what he called a wall of spiders, in a bedroom in his house with post-it notes and string linking people from one pedophile to a child supposedly or whatever. And so it was that sort of information, if you like, that Bunting drew from Lane. Lane was useful for a while and when he wasn't, Wagner and Bunting murdered him. I always remember Elizabeth Hayden's photo. And Elizabeth Hayden was no saint. You know, Mm. she had had a troubled existence. She was not the world's best mother. Mm. Some of her children had been taken from her and she lived a pretty ordinary existence, but she hadn't really done a great deal wrong. And her murder came in that period where they were just looking for reasons to kill people. Oh, my God. It really is. It's just the most profoundly disturbing story, isn't it? But again, I have to say that's what made your book really great to me was that it wasn't just, or it isn't just this kind of catalogue of disturbing stories and stories of disadvantaged people and their horrible lives and their terrible deaths. You do give it this context that makes that makes you think about Australia and how how it is that people can live like this and slip through the net like this, how it is that children can be born and grow up and be allowed to to live like this. That's what's great about the book. I mean, did you set out to, you know, make a statement about Australia or what were you thinking, what were you feeling when you were when you were getting to know these people through the writing of the book? I kind of wasn't. I hadn't set out to make any kind of statement. Mm. And, you know, this is a unique story for a couple of different reasons. There aren't too many serial killings the world over where there's a group of serial killers involved and where some of those who are in the group who kill are then killed themselves. That's unique the world over. So it's also Australia's worst serial killing, obviously. But, you know, the thing that struck me perhaps as I was delving into it is that some of the things that happened to the killers that at least in part made them what they were, were the same things that happened to some of the victims that made them what they were. Yeah. But they reacted to those things in different ways. And I think that perhaps if you take a message from it, it's that there has to be something else to you rather than what happened to you that creates a monster like John Bunting. But certainly I think it was easy for the public of Australia at the time to dismiss some of the victims as losers or all pedophiles or no hopers or whatever. But the reality is they were human beings, some of whom who had endured traumas, who were, for the most part, trying to make the best they could of a pretty ordinary life, a pretty ordinary hand that they'd been dealt, with a couple of exceptions. There were a couple of people in there who were very ordinary humans, but for the most part, these were people who were just trying to do the best they could with what they had. It's one of the things that troubles me the most about a term the police like to use nowadays, certainly in South Australia, about a crime being random or not random or victim was known to oh, yeah, the offender. Yeah, yeah. I find that whole concept offensive. And the reason I find it offensive is because so what if you knew your killer? What difference does that make? That would have been the argument here 12 times over. Knew their killer. The person was known to them. What sort of a justification is that? And I think this was perhaps an early indication of what society in Australia has seen a lot of since when you have a marginalised group of society or a group of society that's struggling in some way because of their location, their gender, their sexual orientation or their race, they're going to be more susceptible to violence. And that was the case here. For more information on each of the 12 victims, stay tuned after the interview. It's obviously very harrowing material, so it's not for everyone. But after this break, Jeremy tells us more about Bunting's depraved escalation. Coming up on Australian True Crime, Jeremy remembers how the full extent of the shocking story finally all came out. But first, he takes us in to the notorious bank vault in Snowtown. Are you saying that you were in the bank vault? I was, yep, that's right, a few days afterwards. I was working at the Adelaide Advertiser at the time as a crime reporter, police reporter, we were called, and on the day that this story broke, which was the day after the bodies were discovered, the police managed to keep it secret quite successfully for 24 hours, which was a fair effort and probably wouldn't happen in this day and age. I can't remember how, how the bodies were discovered. Can you remind me? So it had gotten to the point where there was 
eight victims in six barrels being stored by the killers in this bank, this disused bank in the vault in the disused bank at Snowtown. And for several months before this time, police, through a series of unrelated at first missing persons investigations into some of these victims, had started to realise that the names John Bunting and Robert Wagner were coming up over and over again. And Mm. so there was some limited surveillance on Wagner in particular and Bunting as suspects, and they had made a trip to Snowtown while under police surveillance. And the police, when they were having a look around Snowtown, came across in a driveway of a friend of Bunting and Wagner lived across the road from the bank in a driveway. There was a four-wheel drive, which they believed human remains had been put in at some point, and police had been looking for this four-wheel drive, and they spotted it there. And so they then made arrangements to go back a few days later. And when they did, the four-wheel drive was there, but the remains weren't, and they were pointed in the direction of the bank, and that's how it all unfolded. And the last person who was murdered there, that was a young man who went there to buy a computer from them, wasn't it? Yeah, so that was um, David Johnson. So that was the stepbrother of James Lusakis. Right. um, Who lured him at Bunting and Wagner's request to Snowtown on the promise of buying a cheap computer. And again, no, this guy, from memory, he didn't fit the bill, did he? he no, he was a- he was making a go of his life. He had a partner. He was employed. He was doing well. He was a nice young man and he was picked because by this point, John Bunting and Robert Wagner just wanted to torture people. Oh. They just wanted to kill people and they just wanted to steal their money afterwards. God. And so he was lured to the bank vault. He was tortured for pleasure. He was tortured for his bank details, his PIN number. And he was ultimately murdered. And, uh, you know, that's when, you know, one of the trademark moments of the uh, case happened when Bunting cut a piece of flesh off the victim and they put it in a plastic glove and walked it across the road to their unwitting mate's house and fried it and cut it up and had a piece each. Just because you've had a dysfunctional childhood or upbringing does not mean you're going to become depraved like that. So there's got to be something else at play with... Do you think it was power? I think it was power, absolutely. I mean, I think it was all of the things that go to make a serial killer. I actually don't think they're that special. I think uh, they have hatred in them. They like the power. They like other people's suffering. And they have God complexes. They like to be God. And Bunting had it in him. And I'm not sure, you know, one of the most perplexing things is I'm relatively satisfied in my own mind that none of the others would have been killers if it were not for John Bunting. No, yeah. I think Robert Wagner would have been a bad person, probably would have spent a fair bit of time in jail, but uh, I don't think any of them would have been killers if not for John Bunting. I'm fascinated that he was still, his behaviour was still escalating, even at that point, that he's now into, you know, cooking a man's flesh, I feel like, gosh, where would it have ended had he not been caught there? I think that part of the reason for that was that he was yearning for the next thrill out of it all. And so typically with serial killers, the way that manifests is the rate continues Mm. and there's trophies and and there is a suggestion that that was part of the reason the bodies were held onto. I think that was more dysfunction and disorganisation as anything else. But then there was also this need to kill quicker, torture longer, and then ultimately do something else like that. And that, there's no doubt that's what was happening. The torture became longer. The types of the torture became more elaborate. The duration of the torture, you know, longer. You know, Fred Brooks endured probably seven hours of torture before he was murdered. I mean, you know, it's just horrendous. Can you remember reporting this for the first time? It's one of those stories that now we take for granted when we were first hearing this story, it was just mind-blowing, wasn't it? When you were reporting this, sitting down to report this story to the country and to the world, you must have thought, who's going to believe this? This is incredible. Yes, to an extent. But one of the things that happened was that no one knew, not even the police, how big this was until after the discovery had been made. So even when the police rolled into Snowtown that day, they were investigating the disappearances of five people. And what they found was six barrels with eight bodies in them. The first front page headline the next day that I was one of the reporters who worked on said six barrels, six bodies. We got that wrong. But that's because some of the victims had been dismembered and so there were parts of bodies in some of the barrels. So six barrels, six bodies. But as you know, there were 12 victims. And so what happened was this was the beginning of an investigation, not the end. Often when a serial killer is caught... It's the end of an investigation. 
we know there's 20 people missing in the US and it's mm. been happening for years and finally there's been an arrest or whatever. This was unique again because of this. It was a discovery, an investigation into five missing people who by then they had assumed, the police had assumed were murdered. They were looking for bodies when they went to Snowtown. But then the scale of what was uncovered was obviously shocking and it took a few days and a few weeks for the full extent of it to become clear. And with Thomas Trevelyan, for example, you know, he was a young man who was found hanged in a park and that death was was filed as a suicide. And so it was only really after this came all out and all to fruition that the police went back and looked at that and charged Bunting and Wagner with his murder as well. It would have been um, incredible to see the detective's room with all the links and because you'd also be looking at aspects of fraudulent activity too because they were ripping off a lot of money too. They were and that was one of the things that really brought them undone because, you know, the way this case started was Clinton Drasice is finally reported missing, but unfortunately his remains weren't matched with his photograph. His skeleton, his skull wasn't matched with his photograph by a forensic expert who really should have been able to do that. And so the alarm wasn't ringing as loudly as it could. But there was a a senior copper, Paul Schramm, who got put in charge of major crime and he instituted a new system, which is really quite common now, for reviewing cold cases. And in particular, he was concerned about the number of cold missing persons cases that might really actually be murder. And you've got to remember, this is 20 years ago. So the computer systems, the intelligence systems, they weren't then what they are now. And so there was Clinton Tresize, he's missing. Then there was Barry Lane, he's missing. It was established that the two of them had an association. Then John Bunting and Robert Wagner name names come up. Then there's another missing person in Suzanne Allen. And again, the names come up. And then Elizabeth Hayden, Mark Hayden's wife, mm-hmm. disappears and Bunting and Wagner, their names again come up as a friend of Hayden. And that's when things really started to gather momentum. But even before Elizabeth Hayden disappeared, it was as part of this review into the Lane missing persons case, the police had noticed that his pension was still being drawn, his social security payments were still being drawn from his bank account. Where they were being taken from had changed. He's reported missing on X. Before that, he'd taken his money out of this bank machine. After that, this bank machine. So they put a camera on the bank machine and they filmed Robert Wagner withdrawing his money, which he would do time Mm. and time again. So Wagner, then Bunting, they're under suspicion, then Elizabeth Hayden disappears. All of a sudden, Mm. police think it's murder. It's declared a major crime secretly. They're working on it. And then that's when the Snowtown discovery happens. So once they arrested Wagner and Bunting Mm -hmm. and then Hayden, I guess, and Vlasakis pretty quickly. So Bunting, Wagner and Hayden were all arrested on the morning after the bodies were found. Wow. So in dawn raids, if you like, on Mm. their homes. And Vlasakis, not for a while, how he became to be implicated in the case, it took some time. He's much younger, obviously. He's much younger, yeah. yeah. And essentially his mother was being viewed as a suspect, Bunting's partner was being viewed as a suspect, more so in the stealing of victims' money after the event. Mm -hmm. It wasn't clear whether or not she knew they were victims of murder. She's dead. She died of cancer. She likely knew. She likely took part in some way in the murder of Ray Davies. And so... Vlasakis was scared for his mother initially, but then when the heat was on and the focus of the investigation was all around him, he made a confession to a friend that he had some involvement and that friend tipped off the police and so the focus went on him as well. Wow. So was he the first to speak? I mean, of the group, did people speak? Did did they start turning on each other? He's the only one that spoke. Okay. So John Bunting has never cooperated He's, he never pleaded guilty. He he sat through a trial and he was found guilty of 11 of the 12 murders. Robert Wagner was convicted of 10 of the murders and with assisting after the fact in the murder of Clinton Tresize. He pleaded guilty to some of those but didn't make any confession, didn't implicate Bunting, still sat with him at trial. So mm. he was obstinate in his admission of some of the crimes. Mark Hayden, as you know, was never con- he was charged but never convicted of any murders, so he's serving his time for assisting offenders. I did not. Um, I don't remember that. Yeah, wow, so, that's amazing, isn't it? So Mark Hayden is not a killer. He's not a convicted killer. How did? How was that? Well, Mark Hayden was initially charged with the same sort of holding charge, if you like, as the others, and then he was charged with some of the murders that police believed he had played a part in. His in, own wife is one of the victims. He was charged with his wife's murder being a part of that. And initially the Crown case was 
that he should be found guilty of all of the murders by joint enterprise in that he was working with the killers, sometimes directly, sometimes indirectly, but his legal team succeeded in having charges dropped, charges knocked out, trials severed, and it eventually got to the point where it was only able to be proved that he assisted offenders and uh, he was um, jailed for that and remains in jail, but he's due for parole, I think. Yeah. Wow. Do you think he'll get it? I think he'll get parole within the next few years. I mean, at the end of the day, he's not a convicted killer. Yeah. But does he have blood on his hands? I believe he does. Um, it's hard to argue he doesn't. But in the world of broadcast media, you can't sit here and call him a killer True. when he hasn't been he's convicted. Not, so. not. And Mark Hayden is a sit back. He's not an active, he's a pretty passive, quiet kind of person. And I think the reality is John Bunting uh, was the, for the lack of a better term, I hate using the term the mastermind, yeah. if you like, but he is no mastermind. Yeah. Mm. He's a pretty blunt instrument. And Robert Wagner was the muscle and other people were accomplices who were drawn in and out. And I think initially because Mark Hayden was arrested at the same time as the other two, there was this perception that they were the three killers. But the reality is Bunting's running this show, Wagner is the muscle, and, you know, and just as evil, and then others are being drawn in and out. I suppose it could be argued too that it's it's a pretty terrifying situation to be in and I suppose there are lots of complications. What about Vlasakis? So, yeah, so with Vlasakis, once he came under police pressure, it didn't take him long to become unstitched, if you like, mm. in terms of his denials. They didn't last long. He did it initially to protect his mother. And he basically then confessed and sat down and did marathon interviews with police. So he's a young man. He's frightened because he knows what he's done. Yeah. He's frightened because his mother, who's dying of cancer, is implicated. And his denials initially were, he said, about protecting her. He was probably trying to protect himself initially, but it all collapsed on itself for him and he gave police a roadmap to the crimes. And the reality is if he hadn't given them the roadmap to the crimes that he gave them. They would not have discovered some of the things they discovered. They would not have identified victims as quickly as they did. They had bodies in barrels, still didn't know who some of these people were at the point James Lasarkas is doing these tell-all marathon interviews with detectives who are then feeding the information out and it's being investigated. So James Lasarkas was a witness in Bunting's confessions in the time before he took part. So he would talk about the Tresice murder. He would talk about the Barry Lane murder. And then he was a witness in the crimes that he had taken part in. And it was really the fact that he confessed and pleaded guilty to the crimes that he was convicted of that ultimately meant that he will one day potentially see the light of day, you know, a non-parole period was set yeah. for him. So Yeah, he was sentenced to a minimum of 26 years. That's right, that's right. In 2002, so, yeah, I mean, he's got a long way to go. 26 years is the minimum. It's become pretty fashionable for lawmakers to not let killers out when their non-parole period comes up, so mm. I suspect he'll serve a lot more time mm. than that, and I wouldn't be surprised if he's never released. I wouldn't be surprised. Because he was young and because I have this image of him being being an abused child, mm. Vlasakis, that I, it seems so unfair to me. But, you know, I know that's just... Yeah, that's what I was thinking. That's the but, sentimentality yeah. and that's the emotion that, that runs away with us. But the reality is Mark Hayden was charged with 12 murders. Absolutely, all, 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 all and Vlasakis pled guilty. All but two were dropped, yeah. so it became two. Uh, yeah. The prosecution was unable to get a conviction for those. Mm. He was found guilty of assisting in murders, including his wife's murder and given a minimum of 18 years, I think it was, off the top of my head. So, you know, that's uh, that's a significant punishment. James yeah. Lasakis took part, lured mm. people, mm. took part in murders, helped torture people, covered up the crimes and did so to the point where then other people were murdered. Yeah. How much of my emotional reaction do you think is also about the movie? Oh, now, the movie, God. I know that's silly, but... It's disturbed me beyond What did belief. you think about the movie? I'm going to disappoint you because I haven't seen it. Oh, oh God. Boy. Do you Sorry. know... Let's have a movie night. No. Oh. no, let's not. That film shook me in a way that... Oh. I don't usually get shook by that, but there's... Maybe I'm letting the film colour my... That's what I'm saying. I just sat here and realised yeah, that I'm visualising like, oh, the boy in the movie exactly. like an idiot. It's meant to shake you. And why haven't you seen the movie? It's an interesting question. People have asked me that mm. um, before. And I think I've got it on a disc, but I've never watched it. Yeah. I think there's a couple of reasons for that. I was really particular about this book in that I'm a journalist mm -hmm. and so it needed to be a journalistic account of what happened. So. Yeah. 
There's no license. This is supposed to be an extended piece of journalism. I feel like sometimes once you get to the movie point, it goes beyond that. And while they're based on facts, they're fictionalized. And I'm not necess- I didn't. I wasn't oh. necessarily looking to watch Mate, it. So everyone who's everyone who's seen the movie will know the scene we're yeah. all thinking about right now. Yeah. And of course, yeah, you know, it's it's all about setting up Lasarkis as the victim of abuse and mm. and and that is probably the scene that makes us all for the rest of our lives think about this person who is now a man but for the rest of our lives we just can never think of him as anything but a victimized boy and it just, just all seems so unfair and so inescapable and Look, but you know that's I mean, what it's James Vosakis was abused by his own father yeah who died in front of him mm. and then he was abused by a pedophile who lived up the street mm. because mm. his drug affected mother wasn't a wake up to what was going on. And then he was taken in by, as luck would not have it for James Vlasakis, a serial killer mm. um, who drew him into his crimes. But at the end of the day, and I know it's easy to say, but he could have ended it at some point by picking yeah. up the phone and calling for help and not actively being involved in murders and then luring people, including his own stepbrother who'd done nothing to him, to his death. I read this book when it first came out and I never ever thought that I would be doing any true crime podcast or anything like that Mm. or that I'd ever meet you. But I remember thinking, wow, this book is different and it's because you have given me, you taught me something I wasn't expecting to find. I was expecting to read a book about gruesome crimes and, and I got this other experience where I got context and I thought, oh, they come from a broader place and they come from a... This is a much more important document than I was expecting. I think telling the story of how the victims came to be in the place they were mm. and why it is that that their vanishing wasn't noticed or the alarm wasn't raised sooner, I think that had to be done to be fair to them. Yeah, you made us look at them and no one was looking at them when they disappeared. No one was looking for them and no one was looking at them. It took this and it took you to, to make us see them. And I think if, if you allow yourself to look at this case and write these people off as, as no-hopers or pedophiles, mm. Mm. well, that's what John Bunting thought about them. While recording this interview, we began to discuss the victims of Bunting, Wagner and Vlasakis. But I'm sure you probably noticed that we became a little overwhelmed and we failed to mention all of them. So here now are the 12 victims. Clinton Trezise, as discussed earlier, was the first victim. He was murdered in 1992, bashed over the head with a shovel as he sat on a couch in Bunting's living room after being invited over for a visit. It would be three years before Bunting murdered again. Ray Davies, as we've also heard, was a pedophile who was living in a caravan in the backyard of Suzanne Allen's house. He was murdered by Bunting and Wagner in 1995, and his body was later discovered by police in the backyard of Bunting's house. Suzanne Allen, Ray Davies' landlady, certainly died, and her remains were certainly found in a barrel in Snowtown, but no conviction for her murder was ever recorded against Bunting, Wagner or Vlasakis. They claimed she died of natural causes, and the court accepted their claim. Michael Gardner was a 19-year-old man murdered by Bunting and Wagner in 1997, His remains were also found in a barrel in the bank vault at Snowtown. Barry Lane was originally part of Bunting's inner circle, despite the fact that he'd begun a sexual relationship with Robert Wagner when Wagner was just 13 years old. Lane was last seen alive in October of 1997, and his dismembered remains were found in the same drum as Michael Gardner. Barry Lane's former housemate, Thomas Trevelyan, was known to have had psychological problems. He assisted Bunting and Wagner in Lane's murder, but then told people about it. He was subsequently driven to the Adelaide Hills by Bunting and Wagner and hung from a tree. His remains were found a few months later, and his death was ruled a suicide. Gavin Porter was a friend of Bunting's young stepson, Jamie Vlasakis, and he came to stay with them in early 1988. Bunting accidentally stuck himself on a used syringe that Porter, a heroin addict, had left behind on the family couch. Porter was murdered soon after. His remains were found in a barrel in the bank vault in Snowtown. Shortly after that, Troy Ude, Jamie Vlasakis's half-brother and one of several men who'd molested Jamie during his childhood, was also murdered. 
Bunting, Wagner and Vlasakis drove to his home and dragged him from his bed. His remains were found in a barrel in the bank vault at Snowtown. Fred Brooks was an intellectually disabled man whose aunt and uncle were Elizabeth and Mark Hayden. They were associates of Bunting's and Wagner's. Fred was murdered by Bunting, Wagner and Vlasakis and his remains were found in the bank at Snowtown. Gary O'Dwyer had an acquired brain injury and was living alone when Bunting dispatched Jamie Vlasakis to befriend him and find out if he had any strong family or friend connections. When satisfied Gary wouldn't be missed, the three of them murdered him for the purpose of stealing his disability payments. Elizabeth Hayden disappeared in November of 1998. She was the aunt of Fred Brooks and the wife of Mark Hayden. Mark was apparently not home at the time that she disappeared, and yet it was her brother and not her husband who reported her missing 24 hours later. And it was Elizabeth's disappearance that began the investigation. But it began too late for David Johnson, who was the final victim. He was James Vlasakis' stepbrother. James contacted David, luring him with the offer of a cheap computer. James even drove his stepbrother two hours to the bank in Snowtown, where he knew Bunting, Wagner and Hayden were waiting. Having tortured David until he divulged his PIN number, Vlasakis and Wagner left to try to withdraw money from an ATM, leaving Bunting and Wagner with David in the bank. When they returned, David was dead. As for the perpetrators, they've all kept pretty low profiles since sentencing, apart from Robert Wagner, who continues to fight through the courts for a non-parole date, which could enable him to be released from prison. Experts contend that as he represents himself in court, victory seems unlikely. Thank you for subscribing to Australian True Crime. We'll be back next week with a new case and a new episode.